All right, everybody, welcome back to lecture number two of Reproductive. We're gonna start out this lecture with a pretty big uh, matching exercise. So what I want you to do is hit the pause button, try and match the correct cleft arch pouch to the correct structure. Um, just like I mentioned in the last lecture, maybe just match them with letters or numbers, and then when I give you the correct answers, you can confirm and then draw the lines so you have that to study. Um, but don't ruin you know, a, a, a big uh, slide uh, by doing things in pen prematurely. We don't want that to happen. So go ahead and hit the pause button. Come on back when you think you've got everything. And then what we'll do is talk about the pharyngeal apparatus structures and the corresponding structures, features, etc., which is quite a bit. All right, so hit that pause button and then come on back. All right, let's look at the pharyngeal apparatus. This, of course, is made of the pharyngeal clefts, the arches, and the pouches. Now, don't forget that from the outside moving in, they go in that order. C, cleft, A, P, cap. Cleft, arches, pouches. Just a handy little mnemonic. In case you get a simple anatomy question and you know your brain just doesn't want to work, remember cap, up from outside in. Uh, cleft arches pouches. Now, the pharyngeal clefts are derived from what? They're derived from the ectoderm. Now, initially, we've got four clefts. However, the only permanent structure derived from the clefts, specifically the first cleft, is the external auditory meatus. Now, the second, the third, and the fourth clefts form the uh, temporary cervical sinuses, but those get obliterated by the second pharyngeal, pharyngeal arch. Now, the pharyngeal arch is derived from the mesoderm and the neural crest, and while there are six pharyngeal arches, the fifth will regress soon after formation. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, each arch has an associated cranial nerve, okay? It also has an associated muscular component. It has a associated vascular component, and it has a skeletal and cartilaginous supporting element. Now, in adults, each pharyngeal arch is associated with specific structures within the head and neck. So let's look at the arches and their anatomy before we move on to looking at the pouches. So the first pharyngeal arch is comprised of two parts, okay? It is composed of the distal portion, which is the maxillary prominence, and the ventral portion, which is the mandibular prominence. Now the maxillary prominence, of course, becomes what? The maxilla, as well as the zygomatic bone, and part of the temporal bone. It's also associated with the maxillary cartilage, which gives rise to the incus. Now, the artery of the first pharyngeal arch becomes the terminal portion of the maxillary artery, which is a branch of the external carotid. Now, do you know which nerve is associated with this arch? That would be the trigeminal nerve. So if that's what you said, great job. The first arch gives rise to the muscles of mastication that are innervated by cranial nerve uh, V3. This includes the anterior belly of digastric, the mylohyoid, the tensor velli palatini, and the tensor tympani. Now, it also supplies sensation to the skin of the face, to the lining of the nose and mouth, as well as general sensations to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Now, the second arch has two arteries associated with it, the stapedial artery and the hyoid artery. Now, the stapedial artery is going to connect the embryonic precursors of the internal carotid, internal maxillary, and middle meningeal arteries. Prior to the birth, this will regress. Now the hyoid artery is going to give rise to the corticotympanic artery in adults. Okay, don't forget that. Associated with the second arch is Reichert's cartilage, and that's what we call the cartilaginous component of the second arch. Now this is the precursor to the styloid process, the stapes, the stylohyoid ligament, and the lesser horn and upper body of the hyoid bone. Now, do you know which nerve is associated with Reichert's cartilage? That would be cranial nerve seven. So cranial nerve seven is going to innervate all muscular derivatives of the second arch, which includes muscles of facial expression, the stylohyoid, the stapedius, the platysma, and the posterior belly of digastric. Now the sensory field of the second arch is from the facial nerve and is mostly needed for taste sensation to a specific part of the tongue, which is the anterior two thirds of the tongue. This happens via the corda tympani. 
Now, onto the third arch. The artery of the third pharyngeal arch becomes the common carotid artery and the proximal portion of the internal carotid artery. Now, the cartilage component gives rise to the lower body and greater horn of the hyoid. Now, which cranial nerve is associated with this? That would be cranial nerve 9. Now, do you remember which muscles this arch gave rise to? You said the stylopharyngeus. Great job. From a sensory perspective, this is going to provide taste and general sensation to the posterior one-third of the tongue. So arch two was the anterior two-thirds, arch three, posterior one-third. Now the fourth arch is up next. Now the vascular derivatives of this arch differ between the right and the left side. The right gives us the proximal portion of the subclavian artery. The left gives us the aortic arch. Now, the cartilaginous derivatives of the fourth arch include the, the, the laryngeal cartilage, specifically the corniculate, the thyroid, and the cuneiform cartilages. The nerve that's associated with this fourth arch is the superior laryngeal branch of the vagus nerve. Now, this innervates the muscular derivatives of the fourth arch, which is the constrictors of the pharynx, the cricothyroid, and the levator palatini. Now, the sixth arch vascular derivative also going to differ from right to left, just as in the fourth. Remember, there's no fifth. The right gives us the proximal portion of the pulmonary arteries, while the left gives us the ductus arteriosus. Now, which nerve is associated with the sixth arch? That would be the recurrent laryngeal branch of the vagus nerve. Now, this is going to innervate the intrinsic muscles of the larynx, except for one, which is what? The cricothyroid. Now, sensation from the recurrent laryngeal branch is going to include taste, tense, taste sensation from the epiglottis and the pharynx, uh, general sensation in the larynx, pharynx, esophagus, tympanic membrane, um, external auditory meatus, and part of the external ear. It will also provide the efferent limb of the gag reflex and parasympathetic innervation to the viscera. Now let's finish off this section by discussing the pharyngeal pouches. Now the pouches separate the pharyngeal arches on the endodermal surface. While there are five pairs of pouches, only four are going to give rise to structures in the adult. So let's talk about those. So the first gives rise to the eustachian tube, and the middle ear cavity. The second give, gives rise to the lining of the palatine tonsil. The third dorsal aspect gives us the inferior parathyroids, and this is really high, high yield commonly tested, while the ventral gives us the thymus. And the fourth dorsal aspect gives us the superior thyroid glands, while the ventral gives us the um, ultimopharyngeal body, the C cells of the thyroid. So let me just mention something super high yield here. Commonly, they'll ask the third and fourth aspects here of the uh, pharyngeal pouches. The third, don't forget, is going to give rise to the inferior parathyroids. The fourth, the superior, okay? So make sure you decipher between those two because it's a commonly asked question. Cleft lip and cleft palate are super high yield and tested very often, most likely on the underlying developmental error. So let's touch on those and then we'll move on. So in the cleft lip, the cause of uh, the problem here is failure fusion of the maxillary and merged medial nasal processes. Whereas in cleft palate, the, um, the problem is caused by failure of fusion of the two lateral palatine shelves or failure of fusion of the lateral palatine shelf with the nasal septum and or primary palate. Now these are corrected surgically and the speed will depend quite frankly on the severity. But as a general guideline, you want to try and fix a cleft lip within three to six months of age and a cleft palate no later than 12 months of age. All right, let's move on to our next question. All right, we have another matching exercise. This one's a little easier. Hit that pause button though, try and figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got the correct answers. All right, here are your correct answers. Now when it comes to genital embryology, there's a lot of info they could ask you. So I'm gonna do my best to outline the way you could be asked certain questions so that you don't get frustrated by the general embryology that's probably going to pop up on exam day. So first, don't forget that the default developmental structure is that of a female, meaning we all start out with a female default. So for female genital development, the mesonephric duct is going to degenerate and the paramesonephric duct develops. Now in male development, there's a gene on the Y chromosome. This gene is called the SRY gene. This is the sex determining region Y, also known as the testes determining factor. This is going to lead to the development of the testes. The Sertoli cells will secrete something called malarian inhibitory factor. 
that will act to suppress the development of those paramesonephric ducts. You also get the Leydig cells in on the action, and they are going to secrete androgens that will stimulate the development of the mesonephric ducts. Now, if there's an absence of Sertoli cells or a lack of malarian inhibiting factor, we'll call that MIH, because I struggle to say that word, malarian inhibiting factor, MIH, there will be a development of both male and female internal genitalia, but male external genitalia. We call this streak gonads. Now, there's a 5-alpha reductase deficiency. We'll get an inability to convert testosterone into DHT. This will result in male internal genitalia, but ambiguous external genitalia until puberty when the spike in testosterone causes masculinization of those external male genitals. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the details of the mesonephric and paramesonephric ducts. Now, just as a side note, the mesonephric ducts are often termed, oftentimes termed the Wolfian ducts, the paramesonephric ducts, also the malarian ducts. So just keep that in mind, they're interchangeable. Um, in case the vignette uses one versus the other, you don't get confused. The mesonephric ducts will develop into the male internal structures, except for the prostate. Now from this structure, you get the epididymis, the ejaculatory duct, the ductus deferens, and the seminal vesicles. Now there's also a female remnant of this structure that is known as the Gardner duct. Okay, don't forget that because that's a very important little nugget you want to remember. Now, the paramesonephric ducts develop into the female internal structures, including the fallopian tubes, the uterus, and the upper portion of the vagina. Now, just as a side note, the lower part of the vagina comes from what? The urogenital sinus. Very high yield. So let me just repeat that again. When we're talking about vaginal um, um, development, the upper part comes from the paramesonephric ducts, the lower part from the urogenital sinus. The male remnant is known as the appendix testes. Now, if we get a female who, let's say, has fully developed secondary sexual characteristics, but fails to experience her first menses, we need to consider malarian agenesis. Now, there's also a few malarian duct abnormalities that we wanna be aware of for our exams. Now, these abnormalities include a septate uterus, a bicornate uterus, and something known as uterus didelphus. Now, anytime there's one of these problems, the affected patient will have a decreased fertility as well as an increased risk of pregnancy complications if she's in fact able to become pregnant. So let's take a look at those real quick. The septate uterus first is a relatively common condition. And this is caused by an incomplete resorption of the septum, and we can treat this with a procedure known as a septoplasty. The bicornate uterus is next, and this is caused by an incomplete fusion of malarian ducts. The final condition is the uterus didelphus. This is basically what happens when we have a double uterus, cervix, and vagina. This is due to complete failure of fusion, okay? Well, let's move on to our next question, another matching uh, exercise here. Hit that pause button, come on back when you think you've got the right answer, and we will talk about the male and female genital homologs, super high yield embryo slash anatomy questions. All right, so this topic of male and female genital homologs is super high yield, like I mentioned. So let's take a look at the undifferentiated structure and then talk about what you can expect to get if we expose it to both DHT versus estrogen. So first, starting with the genital tubercle, when this gets exposed to DHT, which remember, we get DHT from converting testosterone to DHT via 5-alpha reductase, we get the formation of the glans penis, the corpus cavernosum, and the spongiosum in males. Exposure to estrogen gives us the glans clitoris and vestibular bulbs. The urogenital sinus, when exposed to DHT, gives us the bubble urethral glands and the prostate gland in males, of course. And then in females, exposure to estrogen is going to create the greater vestibular glands, the urethral glands, and the periurethral glands. Now, the urogenital folds ex on exposure to DHT will give us the ventral shaft of the penis in males and the labia minora in females, of course, when exposed to, to estrogen. And then we have the labial sacral swelling. Expose the labial sacral swelling to DHT. What does that give us? Gives us the scrotum in males. If we expose to estrogen, we get the labia majora in females. Now, before we move on to our next section, let's cover a couple of high yield penile abnormalities, uh, which are hypospadias and aphyspadias. Now, these both refer to an abnormal urethral opening on the ventral aspect of the penis, which is hypospadias. 
and the dorsal aspect of the penis, which is epispadius. Now, in the anatomical structure, if, I'm, if you're standing um, in the anatomical structure, remember that the dorsum of the penis would be on top and the ventral aspect of the penis would actually be on the bottom. Just keep that in mind so you can visualize it because a lot of students, believe it or not, get these backwards and you have to be able to recognize anatomically where we're looking. Otherwise, you just will screw this up and you can't let that happen. So epispadius happens from, which remembers on the dorsal aspect, this happens from faulty positioning of the genital tubercle and hypospadius results from failure of the urethra folds to fuse. Now, do you know which of these is more common, hypospadius or epispadius? That would be hypospadius on the ventral aspect of the shaft, which remember in our anatomical position would be underneath on the bottom. This is associated with a couple of things, hypospadius, including the 5-alpha reductase enzyme deficiency. It's associated with inguinal hernias, cryptorchidism, and cordy, which is a downward or upward bending of the penis. Epispadius is associated with something important having to do with the bladder. Do you know what it is? It's associated with extrophy of the bladder. Now, don't forget that the 5-alpha reductase deficiency results in an insufficient production of DHT from testosterone, of course. As a result, males are born with external genitalia that either aren't clearly one sex or the other or often mistaken for female genitalia. We have not exposed the external genitalia to testosterone or to enough DHT. As a result, they don't differentiate properly and we don't know what they are. Once they hit puberty and testosterone spikes, development should ensue. All right, let's do three true or false questions testing our knowledge of gonadal drainage. Um, what we'll do is we'll go through these questions. I'll give you a quick blurb based on whether it's true or false, and then we'll talk about this in a little more detail at the end. So let's start with our first question. I'm going to stay here with you. Don't hit that pause button. I'll give you a few seconds. Is this first question true or false? What do you think? This is true. Ovaries, the testes, the fundus of the uterus, they're going to drain the paraaortic lymph nodes. Next question, true or false? This is super high yield, this topic here, and we'll talk about it in a little more detail shortly, but this is actually false. Remember, the right gonadal vein drains into the IVC. So if this is your IVC, the right gonadal vein drains into it. Your left gonadal vein, let's call this your um, left renal vein, your left gonadal vein drains in an, at a 90 degree angle into that, that then drains into the IVC. All right, let's move on to our next question. True or false, I'll give you a few seconds. Go ahead. All right, so I actually gave you the answer as I uh, said a little too much in my last explanation. This is false. Remember, your left renal vein here, uh, your gonadal, your left gonadal, left spermatic vein um, enters at a 90 degree angle, which is why you're going to find out in a moment when we talk about this, left-sided varicoceles of the testes are more common than right-sided. So let's talk about the, the, the drainage here. So venous drainage is just as a topic, super high yield, uh, because it's pathology, it's anatomy, um, you know, it's a little bit of everything. So let's take a look at what this is all about. So first, if you consider the drainage from either the left ovary or testes, it travels via the left gonadal vein to the left renal vein and then into the IVC. Now, a couple important things to consider. First, the left renal vein and the right renal vein, they're not actually the same length. Which is longer? That would be the left renal vein has to travel further to get to the IVC. Now, when we compare the left side gonadal vein to the right, the right, as I mentioned, as you can see on this picture here, drains right into the IVC. It doesn't go into the right renal vein, just like it does on the left side. This is important because the fact that the left spermatic or left gonadal vein has to enter the left renal vein at a 90 degree angle makes it more susceptible to the formation of that testicular varicocele. The angle, 90 degrees, when you consider a gravity, it's going to increase left-sided venous pressure. That simply increases the risk that blood's gonna back up, and that's why men get testicular varicoceles on the left side overwhelmingly more often than on the right. So let's look at the lymphatic drainage in the reproductive structures, and then we will move on. So first, the ovaries, the testes, and the fundus of the uterus drain through which lymph nodes? This was the first question, para-aortic. What about the body of the uterus, cervix, and superior part of the bladder? What lymph nodes do these drain through? Uterus, cervix, superior bladder, they drain through the external iliac nodes. The prostate, cervix, corpus cavernosum, and proximal aspect of the vagina, 
drain through which or into which lymph nodes. That would be the internal iliacs. The distal vagina, vulva, scrotum, and distal anus drain through which lymph nodes? That would be the superficial inguinal nodes. And finally, through which lymph nodes do the glans penis and glans clitoris drain? That would be the deep inguinal nodes. So the guys, you want to realize that when we're dealing with a topic like, like um, varicoceles, its path, its anatomy, its physio, you want to be able to understand that, but also what are the accompanying things around it, such as lymph node drainage? These are all things that you want to think of as high yield, right? So what's a problem? And then what surrounds it? What are the, what's the drainage? What's the vessels? You always want to make sure you know all of these things because this is all just fair game for anatomy, for embryo on your exam. All right, let's call it quits at this point for this lecture. It's about 20 minutes in. Um, we will see you on the next lecture. Thank you.